Good morning, everyone. Um, unfortunately, slides today won't be translated into French. Um, we didn't quite have time to, uh, to, to, to get that uh, done in time. Um, so we'll just have to try and speak slowly. Uh, if, if we are speaking too quickly or you find our extremely dodgy accents um, difficult to understand, please let us know. We, you know. we want to make sure you guys get the most out of this session. So um, we, we'd rather go slower and, uh, and repeat ourselves and, and make sure that we're actually uh, making ourselves understood. So the universal sign is hands up like a wounded giraffe if you cannot understand us. Okay. Okay, so, so this talk is called Improving Resource Utilization. Um, and what it's, it's really about is it's really time to think about how we, uh, how as Java programmers and in the Java environment, we can get better uh, utilization and, 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 and better consumption of resources. Because if you think about it, our, the computers we have today are extremely powerful machines. Uh, and th there's kind of a, a sort of a sense, a nagging doubt that many of us have that we're really not getting the most out of them that we could. So in this talk, we're going to talk about some of the reasons why that is uh, and um, potentially what we can do to help. So, OK. So who are these guys? Well, here's uh, just some of the things that we've, uh, we've been involved in over the years. Um, we, we wrote a book together, um, Ben Evans. That's Martin Verberg, and uh, we're really just a couple of community and open source guys uh, who, who, who found themselves working in a financial technology background and decided they liked working together better than, uh, better than they liked working for banks. <laughs> so what's this talk all about? Well, here's some of what we're going to cover today. We're going to start off by talking about um, the history and some of the design aspects of the Java virtual machine, which you might not have ever thought about. Um, hopefully you have, but m maybe you haven't. Um, we're going to talk a bit about a couple of specific examples of those design principles. Uh, then we're going to talk about where we are today. Um, there's a bunch of questions that we're going to use to drive discussion of, uh, of, of today. Ah, and Heinz has just turned up. This means I'm bound to get some very difficult questions from him. So I'm sure you'll all look forward to, uh, to Heinz ragging on me later in the session. <laughs> That's why I'm standing over here. <laughs> and then we'll talk a bit about the future. So, um, so let's get started. Okay. One, one thing we're going to come back to again and again, though, is this thing is more powerful than the computer that sent the space shuttle up in the 60s. Right? So why is it we need to have eight core machines to run a small Java payroll app which serves 10 users? Hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a one to ponder. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. OK. So. There's one design principle which underlies the whole of the Java platform, which you, you may never have thought about. And it's, it's this one, that the platform uses dynamic runtime information to make management decisions about executing processes. OK, now that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. So let's try and unpack that a bit. So, so what, what does it do? Well, it's one of the great insights from the 1980s about software, that there's all this really interesting empirical evidence about the behavior of software that's only present in the runtime behavior. So at compile time, if in a traditional C or C++ world, where you just do all your compilation up front and you, you, know, you, you don't have any information about what the runtime behavior is. So you can't influence that. You can't make any smart decisions about where to optimize the code and where to optimize the behavior because y you're, you're compiling too soon and all of your, your decisions about the code are happening much too early and without that runtime information. So a good example will be the Young Generational Hypothesis. Hands up if you know what the Young Generational Hypothesis is. OK, a few people, so it's probably worth covering. It's just this. Virtually all objects die extremely quickly. They're like James Dean. <laughs> <laughs> they die young. They die young. So if you're going to do a platform which has managed garbage collection, it makes sense to take advantage of that and to divide your memory space up in such a way that collection of young objects is cheap. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into that into too much more detail, but that, that basic insight it underlies generational garbage collection and it underlies a ver one of the most important aspects of the entire platform. Okay? Platform ergonomics and, and dynamic heap sizing. That, that obviously came out in Java 5. Again, that, that's an example of... Um, of the, this way that we use dynamic runtime information. But let's, um, let's do a slightly more complex example. Let's talk about method compilation. Okay, so 
Does everyone know what, what a V table is? Hands up if you know what a V table is. Okay, a smattering of people. It's just a collection of function pointers which allow you to do a virtual method dispatch. That's, that's the C++ jargon for it. In Java, of course, all of our methods are virtual, which means that they can be overridden, except for the final ones, of course. But, but in Java, virtually every method can be, can be overridden, overridden um, and that's because they're virtual methods. Okay? So what does Hotspot do? Hotspot uses an amazing insight which you can only get from analyzing the runtime behavior of code. And that is, you spend most of your time in a very small amount of your methods. Most, most of your methods you touch once, maybe not at all. But the vast majority of your time is spent in a very small amount of the methods. That's an amazing insight. And what it means is you can, you can use that to produce a platform which has much better optimized compilation tasks. Because most of the code which gets compiled in a C++ app is rarely, if ever, run. So why do you want to waste time and waste your resources in compiling it? But hang on a second, Ben. Compiling's cheap. So exactly. why not compile everything up front? Well, it, 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 because compilation's cheap, it means it's not a problem to do it at runtime. And why not do it up front? Well, because you're sacrificing information. You have all of this nice runtime information which is available to you when you compile. You can decide when to inline methods and when not to. Um, in C++, there's actually a, 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 a pragma, a compiler directive, that you can give to the C++ direct, uh, compiler, which tells you when to inline a method. It's called the inline pragma. And it says, I want you to take this method, and instead of making it into a real method, I want you to just cut, copy and paste, compiler, the content of the, that method wherever you see a, a method call to it. Sounds great. You can decide which are your small methods, like getters and setters, and you can control the inlining of them in your C++ app. Hands up if you know what the inline pragma in C++ actually does. That, that's right, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because it turns out that humans are rubbish at deciding when, when a, a method is good to be inlined and not. So the compiler completely ignores your inline pragma. Because you're bad at it, you're all bad at it, I'm bad at it, everyone is bad at it. Okay? But in Java you can do something smarter. Does anyone know, why, why don't we have an inline pragma in Java? Because of the JIT, exactly. Because the platform itself is making a runtime decision with runtime information about what needs to be inlined. It doesn't need to guess. It doesn't need the, the, the programmer to tell you. It can work it out. It can use that runtime information. And it turns out that inlining, automatic inlining, is the single most powerful optimization that the Java JIT compiler makes. Okay? So this runtime information stuff, it's not some theory and not, not some thing which has no practical value. The, the, the top two um, optimizations that it, that it makes come directly from this, this view of runtime code. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we have, we have a collection of, of where our methods point to. You start off with interpreted methods. When you figure out which are the hot ones, you can compile the ones that you actually need to compile. You can find the ones which are in line and, and, and patch those as well. Okay, we'll talk some more about this when we actually talk about modern JVMs. But let's go on to another piece of design. So, hands up if you've ever heard the term write once, run anywhere before. Hands up. Yeah, very old crowd today. <laughs> How so many of you still believe it? <laughs> <laughs> so this was an old Sun marketing term, but it turns out that actually there is, there is some, some actual uh, engineering smarts and some thoughts uh, behind it. Uh, and what it really is expressing is it's expressing the need to be operating system and processor independent. Now, the weird thing is, is that history always looks inevitable with hindsight. So people say, well, why do, you, why do you do that? I mean, there are only a handful of platforms, and they're all pretty similar to each other these days. You know, they're all POSIX platforms. Windows and Linux are different in a lot of ways, but also quite similar. But, so why, why do you need to care about this? Why do you need to have this independence and this platform independence idea? Well, because in 96 and 97, when Java was coming out, the world didn't look like that. We didn't know that Intel was going to conquer the world. Uh, we didn't know that, um, that, for example, that risk chips were going to die a horrible death. You know? when, when Windows NT came out, it, it started off running on more architectures than just Intel, because it needed to, because it wasn't known, and even Microsoft didn't really think that Intel was necessarily going to win, so they had to have an operating system which was, was capable of being ported across architectures. Yeah? And all of this seems really strange to us now, looking back 15 years later. But design decisions are made without foreknowledge. They're made 
only with the information that you have at the time you make a, de a design decision. Perhaps some of you, like me, waste an entire year writing assembly code for MIPS architectures. <laughs> yeah. Damn you, Intel. Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> Not happy. And, uh, you know, and every, every platform you will, you will ever use has baked in design decisions. Has design decisions which, which are made early on in the life of the platform, which always rep represent compromises, because that's what every design decision in, in, a, in, a, in an open platform always represents. It, and and those, those design decisions can't really be changed later. So there are things inside Java that, that yeah, sure, we'd like to change. Finalizers. If, uh, if Josh was here, he'd, uh, he'd probably have quite a lot to say about that. But Engine finalizers and, and, and some of the serialization architecture, and many of the things in Java which are, which are not correct, but unfortunately, we're stuck with. Uh, and that's because they, they represented um, ideas and bets on a future that may, not have come to pa may never have come to pass. It's quite interesting if you go on places like Stack Overflow today or you go to Reddit and you see the younger generation coming through and, and complaining about the internal design of Java and how rubbish it is. When you see those posts, please take a photo of yourself with a robe and a beard and wisely stroke it and say, well, back <laughs> in 1996, this, this is the reason why. So th this is why we are taking you through a bit of history because it, it gives you context as to why Java is the way it is today. Yeah. So write once, run anywhere. It was a strategic bet. It was what, one of the things which enabled the platform to be credible in those years. But there are consequences to it. But let's talk, talk about a specific example of write once, run anywhere. The Java memory model, the JMM. The JMM is actually a very weak memory model. And that's a good thing. It makes it easy to port to architectures. Um, but it also means that you have very weak guarantees. Uh, but think about it like this. If the JMM gave you uh, very strong guarantees for, um, for, uh, for what your memory consistency model is, then that would make the life of the person porting Java to a new hardware platform very difficult. Because if you go to a platform which, which in hardware doesn't have the same level of guarantees as you needed for, for a strong JMM, well, you'd have to write a lot of code to make, maintain those guarantees in software. And that means that the, 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 the amount of effort required to port Java to one of those hardware platforms would be a lot higher. So if you're a Java porter and you're looking at porting to the ARM processor, you're probably quite happy right now that the Java memory model is relatively weak. Yep. Otherwise your job would be well nigh on impossible. So, um, and what's this on the slide? We've got, a, we've got an image up here. What, what's this? Yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a British plug. So, um, <laughs> so we do actually have some, uh, some, some good stuff on concurrency, which... Uh, which Heinz has been working on. Uh, and, and so if you really want to know how weak the JMM really is and uh, how dark and nasty the corners of it are, then, uh, then come and talk to us. Um, although, d does anyone here suffer from insomnia or difficulty getting to sleep? One no? person over there. One person, okay. We've got a well, solution for you. It's called the Java memory model spec. <laughs> yeah? Go and read that. If you can't, if you can't get to sleep, you know, that will put you out like a light. The only, the only thing which is, is potentially at the same level or possibly even worse is the generic spec. Yeah. Again, <laughs> the, the jury is still out on which one is worse. But this actually took a two-hour pub conversation with a bunch of people at Java one last year, and the conclusion yeah. was neither of them won. <laughs> it's bizarre. Okay, so let's, let's talk about you know, the, this, uh, this, this JMM uh, in a bit more detail. Let's do a real example. Wow, I've actually shown some code. That's cool. So here we've got a class which is called Scratch Volatile. And we're talking about the, the behavior of, uh, of volatile fields and non-volatile. And this actually came up, this was from a, from a discussion with Heinz and some other guys <laughs> in Crete just a few weeks ago. So this is fairly hot off the presses. Um, and also, Keynote's decided to do strange things like underline methods. OK, <laughs> thanks, Keynote. Mm, OK. Compile bug. Yeah, compile bug, <laughs> Keynote bug. OK, so, so this is a pretty straightforward class, right? We've got two fields, two integers. Integer x and uh, integer y. And integer x is volatile. And the question is, if, if one thread starts executing this method, finishes, and then signals a second thread to come and execute this method, then what gets printed out according to spec? Heinz, you can't answer this question. He kind says he does not know the answer. Did someone record that? <laughs> yeah. Anybody? No. Anybody want to take, take a guess, guess to what gets printed according to spec? Uh, we've got one and one from, from, from somebody over there. Any advance on one and one? One and zero? We have a one and zero. In 
So, so you're saying that the spec guarantees that one and one gets printed, and you're saying that the spec guarantees that one and zero gets printed. Is that right? It, you, you already had a guess. So what was what was the? Okay, so you're, you're saying that the, 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 the volatile um, right here forces both this and this to get flushed out because, because the spec. Yep, okay, so that's. Do, do, do we have anybody else got with a different idea? Undefined. Undefined, I've got undefined at the back. Okay, undefined. Um, any advance on undefined? This is like an auction. This is great. <laughs> I, I, I yes. see you're undefined. Who, who, you know, it's against you at the back, sir. What's the? Uh, what, what have we got from undefined? Yep. One and undefined. undefined. Wow. Mm. I hadn't heard that one before. That's 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 good. Uh, I'm afraid you're all wrong. <laughs> the um, the actual answer, and this is this is quite neat, is that the spec says that either one and zero. Or one and one will be printed, but, so it, but you kind can't of tell right. which. Which is so 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 one and undefined was close, but the values are defined. The values are either zero or one, so it's not completely undefined behaviour, but you don't know which of these it's going to be. However, look at how. Let's look at this object graph again. So here's a, an ordinary object pointer. This is how an object is laid out in memory inside Hotspot. Two words here. Don't need to worry about those. And here are where the fields come. So they're laid out directly next to each other in memory. So what that means is the hardware guarantees that this will share a cache line. For now. <laughs> so For now. Under, the, uh, under the hardware, as you know, and you can actually buy hardware um, that people provide which don't have this guarantee, which is quite fun to test your concurrency code on. Boom. <laughs> yep. So effectively, you know, the hardware guarantees that Bin variable and Martin variable sit nicely side by side in a cache line, as opposed to far away like we normally are. Yeah. So on every J JVM that you can get your little paws on, um, I guarantee that this behavior will show, always show you one and one. But you could write one which violated this rule, because it's not a rule, it's just an implementation detail. Heinz. Ah, that's a great question. So the question f f uh, from Heinz is, what, what happens if you have a field with, with, with uh, an object with more fields which spills over a cache line? And typically a cache line is always 64 bytes. Now what will happen there, if we just come back to the previous slide, is, so let's suppose that in between X and Y there was W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, W6, on and on and on. This is why we don't let Ben code, because that's his naming convention. <laughs> Um, if that was the case, and uh, so X and Y are now physically separated, so if we come to, come to this slide, then, then, then X is here, and Y is way over here, so that it spans more than one cache line. In that case, then what you're restricted to is just what the spec says. And the spec says that either I equals 1 and J equals 0, or i equals 1 and j equals 1 will be, will be printed. You don't know which. Try it out. That's a, it's a serious suggestion. Just, just write a, a miniature benchmark and have a go. I mean, that's, that's one of the things which is that, that we, we really want to get across, is that people think that uh, a lot of this stuff is dark and scary and beyond the realm of ordinary programmers. But you can write little benchmarks. You know, you can, there are ways of poking at the, uh, at, the, at the JVM and actually seeing how some of this stuff is laid out. And, and you know, if it's the kind of thing which interests you, do do have a poke around. Okay, so that's that's probably a little bit about about where we came from. And um, there's 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 an open question at the bottom here, which is, can we exploit this type of cache line behaviour? And the answer is, of course. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of begging the question, isn't it? <laughs> the answer is yes. Of course, the answer is yes. <coughs> so let's um, let's move on and let, let's talk about today. So these we've done some history, we've done some design principles. Let's look at the state of the world. Let's look at these five. There are five questions there, aren't there? Yes. So there are five <laughs> questions that we, that we want to answer when we're talking about the way that the world is today. So let's start by looking at what a modern JVM looks like. Well, it looks quite a lot like this. Okay. This shows you what happens to your code. You start off with, a, with Java source code, 
um, you compile this. Um, this diagram is actually by Kirk Pepperdine, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, Javac, to turn it into a class file, put into the class loader, which divides it up, puts the, the methods and the bytecode into the method cache. Now there's a runtime, which is executing your code. Things start off in interpreted mode, mm -hmm. just stepping through the bytecode from the method cache. And then after a while, the runtime information starts to kick in. So you start to get up to, does anybody know what, what the default number of times you need to run a method for compilation is? 10,000. In server mode. In client mode, it's, it's, it's 1,500. Okay. Does anybody know what the answer is for a reflective call? Okay. Trick question. Reflective calls are handled differently. Okay. So the, 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 the bytecode is executed in the method cache. The method is called 10,000 times. It then is fed up into the JIT compiler. So the profiler has been telling it all the time, you know, this method's been called, this method's been called. When it hits 10,000, the JIT compiler picks up the bytecode and turns it into actual machine code, which goes into the code cache. Okay? So everything's great, right? We're in the code cache. Well, not quite. Two things can happen. One thing which could happen is that when you compiled the code, you used the runtime information that you have available. And something happens, so you make a decision about compilation based on that information. And you can make assumptions when you're compiling because you, you, you've analyzed the running of the code and you've seen that you know, there, are, there are certain conditions that haven't been met. Maybe you only ever take one branch of an if. Okay, well, so don't bother compiling the other branch. That, that would be a sensible thing to do. And you just have to check that if ever, when you're running the method in future, that you take the other branch of the if, well, then you have to take care of that case. So those kind of, of, of optimizations and those kind of assumptions are built into the Hotspot server compiler. Hotspot will make assumptions about your code. It will never execute anything wrong, because it will always check that its assumptions are, are, are correct before executing code. But it will make assumptions. So one of the things that can happen is some thing later on in the running of your program, typically class loading, class loading often causes this, causes the, the method to no longer be valid. So methods will actually get dumped out of that code cache. Okay? And again, you can play with this idea yourself. So I like to call, annoy the, I like to call it annoy, annoy the code cache. And you basically have a method and you ensure that it gets run 10,000 times and then just don't call it again. And you can actually look under the hood and you can see stuff bouncing in and out of the code cache because it's gone, yes, 10,000 times, I'm putting it in there and it goes, oh, rubbish, you're not calling it again. Well, Back out so, it goes. so here's, a, here's a great example. So, so you can actually control the threshold. You can, you can set the, the, the compile threshold to zero if you want. Um, this is generally a terrible idea because the whole point of doing all of this is to use the runtime information. So you, you kind of should let it gather some runtime information. If you just tell it to compile everything, then you, you know, you're not really using the code cache efficiently. So then we know what happens if the code cache fills up. Anybody? Uh, the Different part of memory. Is, yeah, the, the, the code cache, is, if it ever fills, that's it. Compilation just stops. There's no more compilation. So if you set the, the, the thresholds too low, well, in the phases of app startup, you, know, you, you run a lot of methods which only run at startup. Hands up if you're a Spring user. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Spring's cool. Core dependency injection, it's great. Um, but most of the methods which are actually part of the Spring framework itself are only ever called at startup. So it's a bad use of resources to compile the Spring methods because once your application's up, and you've got the object graph, you never call a method in the Spring Framework again. So if you filled your code cache up with lots of Spring methods from, from the Spring Framework and the Spring libraries, there isn't space for your application code. So if you turn the threshold down too much, things like Spring are going to basically get into your code cache and uh, prevent your application code from sitting there. Yeah. Okay? So in, in general, we, you know, we always advise not to, uh, not to play with the, the compile threshold unless you actually have hard evidence. Measure, don't guess, as Kirk would say. So okay, so this is what a modern JVM looks like. This is great. So we can, uh, we, we can now see some of the things that, that, are, that are resources that we want to, uh, to adjust the utilization of. You know, the, the code cache, 
um, the, the JIT compiler. Um, so let's see about where all this runs. So when, when we get ma machine code, where does it end up running? Well, it ends up running on one of these. So this, this is great. I mean, look at this. This is a huge, complicated bit of technology. This is actually a 2011 Sandy Bridge chip. That's what one actually looks like. So you see we've got your four cores up here. And on these, there'll be some memory as well. So there'll be um, L1 and L2 cache, which is local to, to e each core, and then a shared L3 cache. And a bit of controller down here to actually speak to main memory. OK, looks good. But isn't it really complicated? How did it get to be so big and so complicated? Well, it was largely because of this. Anybody know what this is? Yep, I can hear, I can hear Moore's Law being, being muttered at the back of the room. <laughs> yep, this is Moore's Law. Um, and notice something, this is, a, this is a log linear scale. So between 1990 and 2005, this isn't twice the number of transistors, it's 100 times. So in 1990, there were roughly 1 million transistors per Intel chip. Uh, and by 2005, that had risen to 100 million. So all of this complexity, all of this stuff that we see on, on this slide, you know, it's come because we have a transistor budget. You know? And it's just amazing. Every time I see this graph, I mean, uh, so much has been written and spoken about it that you, you, you kind of think it, it's been done to death. But the, the amazing thing about it is, is just that this, this prediction, it didn't start in 1985. I mean, this is a, a nice, clear, linear graph. If, you, if you've done experimental science, you get a result like this. You feel pretty happy with yourself. You know, this is, this is a good line. But actually, 75, the, uh, the guy that made this up, Gordon Moore, started back here in 1965. And it was only supposed to run for 10 years. It was only supposed to run from here. So the fact that it's gone all the way through to what's almost a 50-year run is incredible. I mean, this is, this is one of the most staggering things in, in our industry. I mean, a 50-year better in our industry. When does that ever happen? Oh, except for this is going to be the year of Lisp. We've been hearing that for about 50 years as well. But, you know, we shouldn't be too hard. We've got the closure boys now, and they're, they're, they're going to sort it out. They really are going to make this the year of Lisp. Okay. <laughs> in all seriousness. So that's, that's pretty good. Um, but there's one caveat about it. What we're doing is we're counting transistors. And transistors are not the same thing as clock speed. And clock speed is not the same thing as high performance. Okay? And the problem here is the memory latency gap. So the chips are getting faster and faster, more transistors, chips getting faster, very good. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you can't actually get the data you need to process to the chip fast enough? Queuing theory. You start mm. getting a backlog. You start getting a bubble in your pipeline. Yeah. So Moore's law is incredibly successful within its own frame of reference, but it's important to remember the caveats. The resources we have, that the, and remember this is all about resource and utilization, we have more transistors. We have utilized those transistors because they're, they're there. They're a nice, abundant resource. But what we couldn't do is we couldn't keep getting the clock speed faster. So we tried other tricks. Hands up if you've heard of chip multi-threading. Yeah? Um, instruction level parallelism. Yeah? Out of order execution, speculative execution, all of these tricks. More and more contortions, basically, to try to hack around this problem that getting memory, getting data out of main memory is very slow and getting worse. Ultimately, those tricks all give you diminishing returns. Okay? So you're chasing after smaller and smaller gains. And at some point, you have to give up. So the only way to use your nice, abundant resource that we have is to do this, is to go multi-core. Because there's, you know, we, have a bun we have transistors. Moore's law is ch churning out chips with more and more transistors. How do you use them? Well, you can't make the clock go any faster, but you can have more of them. So that, in essence, is why the, world is, it, it, the future is multi-core. That's why the resources that we need to utilize are more cores. We'll come back to that. Has, has anybody seen one of those little uh, planetary models which shows the scale of how far away each planet is from the sun? And, and you sort of start seeing that, you know, Earth, etc., are, are quite nice and close, and then sort of Pluto is 
a kilometer down the road, right? This is the same way you've got to view the data that's sitting on the core, then the data that's sitting on L1 and L2 cache, L3 cache. When you go out to main memory, you're going a kilometer down the road. When you're going out to your hard disk or your SSD drive, you're going off the planet to the moon. Yep. That's the sort of scale we're talking about. And I th in fact, the, um, the, 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 the Google guys, I, I hope some of them are in the room, um, have got a great uh, scale which shows you how long access times are. Uh, it, it's measured in nanoseconds, and I think it, it starts with, with registers, and it goes all the way out to network. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's very highly recommended. So if we're going to make good use of these resources, you know, we need to understand them. We need to understand those latencies. We need to, to, to have some insight in the way, into the way that the hardware works. Um, Martin Thompson always talks about mechanical sympathy. It's, it's kind of a similar idea. Okay, so let's talk about what does a well-tuned app really look like? Well, it means that what we're, what we're really dealing with are cache misses rather than CPU speed. So an L3 cache miss causes a fetch to main memory. Yep. And that means that in a well-tuned application, we are, we, we're executing as fast as we can, the, the CPU is, uh, is kept busy, but without data, there's only so far we can go. So, and I've got a typo on my slide, that should say, without data, can't cycle as fast as we like. <laughs> yeah, so, I'll fix that, thank you. Um, memory fetches are expensive. I always think of 120 to 200 um, cycles as being reasonable. But what this means is that the number of clock cycles to execute an instruction varies depending on, how, on what you have to do to get your data. So again, we go back to the kilometer example. You do not want to have to walk a kilometer to go put a spoonful of sugar into your coffee, then walk all the way back and then go, ah, actually, no, I want a second spoonful of sugar and walk a kilometer back down the road again. This is, and the, the, Another interesting historical point is that this didn't always used to be true. In the 1970s, do you know what the most expensive instruction was? It wasn't a fetch. Anybody? Multiply. Multiplying two numbers was impossibly slow. So you'd see assembly code that was written to avoid multiplies, and people would write, handwrite assembly routines to do multiplication by repeated addition, rather than use the multiply instruction. So. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, actually understanding your CPU and needing to hack around its behavior is something which is, uh, we've, we've had a brief respite from as the, the hardware engineers gave us this enormous run of clock speed improvements. But now, unfortunately, I'm afraid, the free lunch is over and we have to get back to understanding our hardware again. Okay. So, we know what a well-tuned app looks like now. Um, it, it's, it's one which is dominated by, by cache misses. Um, but what do we, how do we improve that? How do we get better utilization? Well, let's talk about what we mean by performance. Uh, performance is about access to non-shareable resources. CPUs, memory, I.O., network, all of these things have to be controlled access to because you can't have two executing threads accessing them at the same time. And any time you've got a non-shareable resource, you probably have one of two things. You have a lock and you have a queue. Pretty much any non-shareable resource will have a mechanism to protect it which boils down to either a lock or a queue. You, know, you can think about multi-threading, you can think about memory, um, cache lines, anything. Anywhere you have, you have, you have a non-shareable resource, there is a lock or a queue. Okay? And the sad fact is that Java's utilization rates really could be better. Um, in the 1970s, there were plenty of systems that thought nothing of doing 200 transactions a second. So why haven't our transaction rates gone up? Why are there so many applications out there that struggle even to reach that? You know, we've all seen dog-slow web applications you know, with a relational database. It's some application code, and it's HTTP, the world's simplest protocol. So why do so many people have scaling problems? Why, why do we not have you know, these amazingly high transaction rates? Well. The sad truth is, software has been getting slower, uh, and it's essentially it's our fault. We've, we've, we've allowed ourselves to, uh, to eat the gains that the hardware engineers have made, uh, and that's, that's a pretty sad indictment, really, that, that after 40 years, we're still not getting better utilization than we were in the 70s. Okay? Partly, this is Java's fault itself. Write once, 
run anywhere means do not integrate tightly to the OS. So a Java application, in general, cannot drive the operating system as hard as something like Oracle Database, you know, Oracle or Postgres or, or anything else which is, which is written in C and is fundamentally about I.O. is driving the operating system really, really hard. And Java application servers typically do not. Um, so, for example, if we go back to the, the sort of cache line examples and, and actually being able to directly map your Java variables and your Java objects directly to the hardware, wouldn't that be nice from a performance perspective? And this is, this is the sort of area where Java really currently falls, falls down. Yep. Will it come in the future? Well, who knows? We'll, we'll, we'll turn to the future in a second. But the, 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 the important thing here is the, the first and most dominant issue that we have to, have to address is CPU underutilization. But that's okay, because we've got a plan. First of all, get some better numbers. Once you've got the numbers, focus on them. Focus on the important numbers. Don't try to collect everything. Don't try to analyze everything which is going on in the system, because there's just simply too much noise. But what you can do is you can focus in on the important, the important things. You need to infer from the data so that you can actually detect a trend. And that's, that's statistical analysis. That's inferencing. And then finally, you can make recommendations. And those are the steps. So let's take a look at something quite low level. Model specific registers. Hands up if you've heard of these. Oh, only a couple of people. OK, wow. Mm, interesting. So these are built-in CPU performance counters. They're extremely low level. Um, they're specific to each manufacturer and chip. There are a few common counters, but mostly they vary. They're very common with Intel chips. So if you have a Mac laptop, for example, with a, uh, an i7 Core Duo, something like that, there will be model specific registers on those chips. And what you do is you execute a bit of assembly language, a bit of assembly code to say, I want to enable these model specific registers. And then the counters start ticking and, 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 and ticking up. And then you can read them back from other specific registers. Actually getting access to these is quite difficult. It requires a lot of low-level specialized bit twiddling, which is you know, a pain at the best of times, hard to debug. And it, it means reading the Intel manual, which is generally about 4,000 pages of pretty dense, terse praise. Do people That's remember when they first learned Java about the, the left shift bit operation and the right shift? And then applying masks and all those lovely sort of C-style programming operations you used to do. That's yeah. been our life for the past two weeks. <laughs> and I yep. suck at it. <laughs> Keep getting it wrong. <laughs> and the support for these is very, very specific. Because what you're talking about here is you're talking about access to uh, basically hardware. And the, the interface to it is not OS independent. So for example, Linux provides you with a file system API. So there are, there, are, there are bits of, if you're on a Linux machine, if you root around inside the proc file system, you will find some things to do with CPUs. And if you know the offsets to read into certain binary things, which presents as files, because this is Unix and everything's a file, you can actually, you can actually start to read some of these um, without, without going any, any deeper into the kernel. Um, if you're on a Mac, however, you're writing a kernel extension. Um, I should also say, of course, that the, the Linux support is evolving. So there's uh, the, the very last release of the Linux kernel actually provides a different way of accessing these, these numbers. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's very much uh, hot off the presses, though. Um, I will warn anyone who does want to play with this on the Mac, the existing kernel driver, to have a look at this sort of stuff, teetsy-weensy bit unstable. <laughs> uh, do back up your Mac on Time Machine before yep. you use it. And do, do make sure you actually understand how kernel extensions work and how to remove them in single user <laughs> mode if you have to. I have bricked two MacBook Pros, <laughs> and I'm on my third one. So these model specific good. registers sound, sound good. I mean, they sound really exciting. They sound really different and really new. But in fact, they're not. Because you've actually all used them with this call system.nanotime. Think about it. Does, does anybody know how, how nanotime is implemented? No. OK. So it uses a thing called the TSC, the timestamp counter. And what does that do? Well, it counts clock cycles. And it is, in fact, a model-specific register. It just happens to be a very standard one. And what it does is it just reads the counter off the, uh, off the core. And it needs to be high performance. And you have one of these TSC registers per core. And if you're 
when you, when you receive a clock cycle, when, you're, when you're, you're, your core cycles, you update the counter. And then something else can read, read your counter, read your register, which is holding that counter. And that's, that's a more specific register. That's, that's what it is. So, don't worry, I'm not going to show you any OpenJDK source code. One, one quick thing I'm going to point out here. Look at this bottom one here. If any of you are doing performance tuning or performance monitoring and you're writing micro benchmarks or any sort of benchmarking, please be aware of that last point. And that point is that sometimes your operating system will put your clock counter to sleep and it will stop counting. So all of a sudden you think your code is running a lot faster than it really is. Yep. Nope. <laughs> also bear in mind that, that Java processes migrate between threads, uh, b between cores all the time. So a Java thread can be picked up and moved to a different core. Um, so if you, if you do um, a first read of a, of a counter on one core and a second read on another, you can get really screwy results. Um, the, the support for this, at least on Linux, has got a lot better recently, but up until about 12 months ago, you could actually get these things to go backwards if you, uh, if you were unlucky. Uh, and I'm sorry, I did lie about not showing you any OpenJDK source code. So this is how this is, this is implemented. So this is, this is a bit of Linux code. So if you've got a monotonic clock, which you should, all should have now, hopefully your, your, your kernels have been updated, um, you'll actually get decent answers. And if for any reason you, um, you, know, you, you can't, you, you just fall back to, to this kind of approach here, which is, which is just unfortunate. Oh well. So, how long have we got? 15. Okay. So, let's do some examples of other things you can do with model specific registers. You can look at the, uh, the L3 cache misses. Remember what we said? That the memory profile of a well tuned app is dominated by memory fetch. So, if you have a model specific register which tells you how many L3 cache misses you've got, you, uh, you know, that potentially can, can give you a very good number on how well tuned your app is. So you effectively, it's telling you how many times is your application walking a kilometre down the road to get its ne next piece of data. Yeah? So you can start to infer and then start looking back at your so source code whether you're actually going off and doing this. Yeah. You can count other things as well. You can count involuntary context switches, which are effectively when the, a thread has been forced off, the CPU, uh, off, off a CPU by the kernel early. So generally speaking, when a, when a, when a thread is allocated to a, to a core, it runs for a, a small time quantum, so one millisecond, ten milliseconds, however the operating system has configured it. Um, and if you hit a wait condition, suppose you run into a lock that another thread is holding, well, the scheduler will actually forcibly remove you from the core, and that would be an example of an involuntary switch. So again, having a look at these sorts of numbers might be an indication to you that you've got an awful lot of locking going on in your, in your code. Okay? Yep. And you can investigate. You, you, you obviously, you can get access to these numbers about, about context switches from the operating system. If you run top, you'll see uh, context switches on, on most platforms, you know, how, how many of those are, are happening. But what's, what's happening there is that the operating system scheduler is keeping track of when it forced things. So, so there's something in software at the operating system level within the scheduler that's providing you that number. This is the other side of the equation. This is something at a hardware level, noticing when, when things have changed, when, when there's been an involuntary switch. Um, okay, so the other, the other good numbers are right bandwidth to memory. This is a great number, because once you, you figured out that you're, you're well tuned, and your memory profile is dominated by your L3 cache misses, well, the next question to ask is, are you maxing your write bandwidth? Because if you're maxing your write bandwidth, that's kind of a second level indicator that your application is well tuned. So the, the top number is L3 cache misses. The second number is how am I doing my right, ba right bandwidth? Okay. And the, oh, and the last one of these, the instruction retirement rate. This, this basically, just think of this as roughly how many cycles it takes to execute an instruction. If you've got to do a main memory fetch, this number's going to go up. If all you're doing is lots of addition, this number's going to stay nice and small. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. This is kind of the bleeding edge for utilization numbers. Remember what we said? That we, the first thing is to get better numbers. Then it's to focus on the important numbers. So kind of the state of the art is sort of here with these model specific registers. We still need to, to do more to, to infer and to make recommendations. But that's, that's where we've reached so far. So let's talk about the future. The future has some interesting things in it. It always does. The first of which, is the architecture is changing again. 
we've, we've lived essentially in an Intel monoculture for the last 10 or 15 years. And that's coming to an end. We have GPUs. Hands up if you've done any GPU programming. No? Oh, one person at the back. Okay. So that's something which might, we may well see in the Java mainstream. GPUs are everywhere, and there's a huge amount of resource which could be utilized, which is not. So we need a general purpose framework for how do we, how do we make use of GPUs from within Java code. Remember, this is a dynamic environment which uses runtime information to manage code. What it should be able to do is to reach out to those GPU cores and make use of them for you automatically. You shouldn't have be having to write specialized code for that. It should be something the JVM does automatically. So for those of you who are interested in the cloud space or in, in the data center space, this, this is actually happening today. I, I've seen data centers that have been outfitted not with CPUs, but just racks and racks of GPUs. Right? Yeah. So the, the support for Java will, will have to come if we're going to have Java you know, as a dominant player in this space. Yeah, and the CPU architecture for GPU you, you can't just run a, a Java virtual machine on a GPU. It doesn't, it's, it's, the hardware's not really designed for that. So it means that we need to think more deeply about how, about how we can do that. FPGA. Hands up if you know what FPGA stands for. Okay, a few people. A, an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. This is basically a chip that you can rewire by sending it software commands. So the actual physical, uh, logical architecture of the chip can be altered after it's been deployed. So what you can do is you can, you can essentially use it to program a specific bit of um, application-specific logic onto the chip and then iterate on that, change, change the, uh, the logic that you've encoded on the chip if necessary. So if you remember your AND gates and your OR switches and all those sort of little operations from your CPU course that you did in university all those years ago? Yeah, you remember the one, the one you slept through most of. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's basically changing it on the fly. So you can imagine, imagine these, these, these little robots going down to the hardware and, and literally picking up a, a switch and you know, shifting it off in another direction and plonking it back down again so your code can run more efficiently in this particular case. Yeah, it's very interesting stuff. And the other, the other aspects we have, of course, are multi-core everywhere. I mean, multi-core is, 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 is you know, even mobile, even phones. You, know, the, it, you, you probably will never again program a device which only has one core. I mean... Unless you're, you know, sort of um, an Arduino hacker or someone that really likes that, those, those real low-end embedded spaces, um, the days of single-core chips are, are, are over for the vast majority of programmers. Um, and ARM, this was a big surprise, actually get having, having ARM again on the server. And pro probably Windows 8 will run on an ARM chip. Oh, so that means we need the OpenJDK to run on an ARM chip as well. Because again, we can't cut ourselves out of that platform and, uh, and that space. So I suspect that we'll see. I mean, where, where Red Hat and their port these days? They, Red Hat announced something at FOSTEM. Yes, an experimental ARM um, port for the OpenJDK. So for those of you who would like to see Java running on this natively, um, go, to, go, go to the Red Hat guys and, and see what they've been up to. And um, we, we're going to see if we can all, all help move it a little bit quicker. OK, so that, those are sort of some of the, the, the broad themes in architecture. but the. The big thing, of course, is cloud, okay? Cloud is the future, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and it turns out that write once, run anywhere is a hindrance in the cloud. This is something we really do need to solve because as we're gonna get into, into situations where we need to have decent utilization um, in, in cloud, well, being decoupled from the OS is an issue because it then means you're not well integrated with the OS, you're on top of a virtualization layer, and then underneath that, you've actually got some hardware. So somehow, we need to, we need to, to do something about that. I always talk about drilling through the hypervisor. We need to be able to get down onto the, the actual raw silicon that we're using uh, and make some of that, that, that performance and those, those utilization numbers more visible through the virtualization layer. Um, not an easy problem to solve, but... You know, there are, there are some encouraging signs. It's, it's another one of those old computer science jokes that everyone, everything can be solved with yet another layer of, of abstraction. Yep. And that's what we're kind of doing with virtualization and hypervisors. We're abstracting away again from the hardware. And is this really the right direction to go in? I, I personally have my doubts. Well, uh, it, 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 in theory, it will actually provide better utilization in the end. 
because ultimately you could, you know, you could have smaller, bigger boxes. Um, one of my one of my first jobs was was working for for an investment bank, and uh, I got thrown in with a group of hoary old mainframe hackers, you know, guys in their 50s and 60s, you know, who actually genuinely did have long grey beards. Um, and whenever they, people started to talk about 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 cloud and, and stuff in the later years, they they would always say, well, all you guys are really doing is reinventing the mainframe anyway. And uh, there's a they're right. <laughs> there, there's, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a good pub conversation to be had in there. It's a mainframe with a web browser thrown in front but, of it. So, so, you know, write once, run anywhere is going to give us some problems. Okay, we, we know that. But what's the alternative? None of the other platforms that are out there come anywhere near the JVM. You know, in terms of making decent utilization of the compute resources, you know, it's the only game in town. The engineering effort, the ecosystem, the tooling, you know, the mind share. You, you really wouldn't want to start again. You really wouldn't want to take one of the C Ruby implementations, for example, or PHP, God forbid. But what know. about server-side JavaScript, Ben? Oh, JavaScript as a compilation target is a disease from which we will recover. Who, who here would like to write JavaScript on the server for the rest of their career? D didn't think so. Yeah, it's happening out there, people. Talk to the Node.js folks; they're loving it. Well, I, I, well the, the server sky JavaScript stuff, I think, is always funny. I, I, I saw somebody the other day who said that if you if you actually built a working time machine, then obviously the, the first thing you'd have to do is go back in time and stop Hitler. But the, the second thing you'd do is to go back and find uh, Brandon Ice desk in 1995, take the, his copy of the, the paper about self, which is the programming language which, where prototypes and all of that stuff in JavaScript come from and replace it with a book on Scheme instead. <laughs> so, okay. So, summing up, cloud hype is really two to five years away from reality. I mean, that's, that, that's the fact. None of the hype which, which, which surrounds cloud is really realized. There are some great products out there. There are some solutions which have solved part of the problem space. But compared to what's actually said about it, it doesn't come close. And it won't for, 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 for several more years yet. You have production in, in limited use cases, but compared to the claims, compared to, to, to the industry pundits, it's not a fully engineered solution. Consolidation still needs to happen. Venture capitalists still keep f funding platform companies. And all the time, the money taps on, those companies aren't going to buy each other. The market is not going to you know, consolidate and bring them together. So there's, there, there's no market incentive there. So what that means is that part of the solution that we eventually need is locked up in that company over there. And part of it's locked up in that one. But nobody's got the whole picture. And that's what's, what's, what's keeping the cloud space uh, from, from reaching its full potential. So for those of you who have not tried it yet, you can go to OpenShift, you can go to Cloud Foundry, you can go to CloudBees. Heroku. Heroku. Uh, the stack's going on. You can even go to Oracle's new public cloud offering, IBM's one. They're all out there at the moment, and you can pick and choose as much as you like, but they're not all going to last. Yeah. And this final point, I mean, the other utilization that we didn't talk about is actual physical resources. And that, that is, uh, is actually a very growing area. So some of the, 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 the smartest and most interesting startups that, that we, I've seen recently are actually in this thing called green computing. Basically, I, I forget what the number is. It's something like 8% of the U.S., um, power consumption is now in data centers. That's horrendous. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. So there's a real opportunity there to optimize that as well, to optimize the physical resources that are used for compute. Um, so I think it will be really interesting what happens. I mean, we still don't even have a, a spot price for compute time yet. You know, we're starting to see people almost coming together and saying, you know, let's actually have a true market in compute. Obviously, that needs consolidation in the cloud. Because at the moment you can't transfer your your your, your running process, you know, from Amazon to uh, you know to Heroku completely seamlessly. So, but once once that market consolidates and once those things start to come together, you can actually see a, you know the possibility of a, a a standardized price for computing time. And it goes back to again to what we were talking about before. If we can get a a major platform like Java, which is going to probably dominate the cloud space, okay, to utilize resources such as the CPU more efficiently. So if you've got 10 CPUs running at more or less 100% capacity, as opposed to 100 CPUs running at 10% capacity, you've got less hardware. You're consuming less power. You, have to build, you can build smaller data centers. And you can save an awful lot of money, as well as the electricity grid. Yeah. So summing up, I think the, the, the big sort of takeaway here is that utilization is 
kind of a complex space. There's, there's a lot happening in it. It's very exciting. Um, we think better utilization is, is, is really important. Uh, and if you do too, then come and talk to us. And you know, we'd love to hear what you think about it and um, you know, see if we can help. Thanks. Thanks.